What is it about lighthouses? It's all about people caring for people. It's about light in the darkness. Poems have been written about in books, stories, all kinds of things, paintings and posters and everything you can think of. Lighthouses to me is whenever that light shines, it, it's, a, it's a spiritual light. Hi, I'm Jack Perkins. As far as we know, the first lighthouse built anywhere in the world was outside Alexandria, Egypt in the year 280 BC. It was an amazing structure for the time, 400 feet tall with a wood fire burning atop it. It was considered one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It would be more than 2,000 years before in a brand new nation, the United States, a brand new president, George Washington, from his capital in New York, would commission the first lighthouse to be built right here. Portland Head Light in Maine. With this structure began the story of lighthouses in Maine. And for two centuries, what a story it has been. I, got, I, didn't, I don't get any money from the government or anything for the 28 years that I put in the service. I don't. But I did my part and I'm I'm glad I did. Connie Small was 96 when we spoke with her. She was 20 back when her fiance asked her, did she want to be a lighthouse keeper's wife? She did. His first assignment, though, was the Lubeck Channel Light, which was a stag station. No families allowed, except for occasional visits, which were merry and sometimes unofficially lasted overnight. Elson Small's next assignment did permit families. That was Avery Rock. But it was one of the most desolate, one of the roughest places that you had on the coast. And uh, we spent four years there. From that point on, for more than a quarter century at five different stations, Connie Small lived the solitary, demanding, contemplative, arduous life of a keeper up and down the main coast.
At first, Maine's lighthouses were constructed not alone for the obvious reason, to safeguard shipping, protect lives. It was not solely humanitarian. Just as much, it was commercial. Lighthouses were planned, financed, and erected for the sake of business. America lived on the coast. It relied on the sea, and ships were most likely to travel along coasts and to ports where cautioning, welcoming sentinels stood. Lighthouses, in other words, were good for business. Everything moved by water, you know. Back in the uh, 17th, 18th, 19th century, everything moved by water. Always had, up until the 50s when we got the interstate highway system and then started building cargo jets. But before then, it was lighthouses. These are ageless, powerful, potent places that bespeak of centuries of our maritime heritage here in Maine. Some lights were built to warn. Here lies danger, sail clear of shoals and shore. Some were built to welcome, refuge, safe harbor, await. Some were meant simply to direct, bound for Bangor, as so many ships were when Bangor was America's lumber capital. Leave behind the great light at Matinicus, 25 miles out to sea, and let the light spirits of the Penobscot guide you in.
If there were and are more lighthouses along the coast of Maine than most anywhere, between 60 and 80, depending on when you count it, it's because there are also here more islands and ledges of which mariners need be cautioned. Challenging tides, ranging up to 30 feet. Sudden, thickly enveloping fog. And some frightfully fierce storms. With all those, Maine has needed all these. On what used to be Portland's breakwater, this is called Bug Light. Not a name with the dignity its builders must have had in mind. Built in 1855, rebuilt 20 years later, it was meant, for some reason, to resemble a 4th century Greek monument, 
replete with Corinthian columns. Today it remains unused and unusually distinctive. Over the years, lighthouses have come in many shapes and sizes, and Kirk Money is rather a student of that. We begin by looking at towers. Uh, the earliest tower in Maine is the tower at Portland Headlight that was constructed between 1787 and 1790. That tower is, is a rubble stone structure with a conical shape. The conical shaped towers would continue in use in Maine up through the 1830s and 40s. With the establishment of the U.S. Lighthouse Board in 1852, professionally trained engineers, graduates of West Point Academy, were placed in charge of the design and construction of light stations in Maine. During the second half of the 19th century, the lighthouse engineers were responsible for introducing a number of innovative designs to light towers in Maine. Among these are round brick towers, tapered square towers, cast iron towers, caisson or the so-called spark plug towers, as well as the octagonal shingled towers along the lower Kennebec River, all constructed in 1897. The height of the light is what's always been crucial. First, to raise the light itself to safety above raging storms. Second, to allow the light to be seen from far enough away. A light 50 feet up can be seen for eight and a half miles. 100 feet, almost 12 miles. The tallest lighthouse in Maine is on Boone Island, six miles offshore. Not much of an island. Mainland fishermen used to come out and leave packages of food and clothing on the rocky ledge for any mariners who might be marooned here. Those packages, or boons, gave the ledge its name. The first lighthouse in 1800 was washed away, so another one was built, and it washed away, and another one until finally the current tower went up in 1855. Its light, 137 feet up, can be seen for 19 miles along Maine's westerly coast. Over the years, there have been many fuels for lighthouses, wood fire, tallow candles, whale oil, kerosene, electricity, today solar electricity. But whatever the fuel, it was always the keeper's preemptive responsibility to light that light. 
You have a little brass can, a beautiful little brass can, that you fill with denatured alcohol. You put a little, fill a little container, and you put it under the mantle. And that heated the mantle, and when that mantle got white hot, a white, you turned it on, and then it would vaporize and you have your light. Fuel creates the light, but it is the lens that focuses and amplifies it. And the most ingenious lens was designed by a Frenchman, Augustin Fresnel. It is a jewel of refraction and reflection. Large Fresnel lenses today are worth millions of dollars. Visit the Shore Village Museum in Rockland. We, we actually, actually call ourselves not only the Shore Village Museum, we're Maine's Lighthouse Museum. And we have the largest collection of lighthouse lenses on display any place in the United, United States. We have every, every order of, of lighthouse lens except the first order. Now, order is simply size. Now, our biggest one is a second order from the Petit Manan Lighthouse. Uh, it's about 80 miles east of Rockland. Uh, and uh, it, it's, it, our ceiling in the, in the front room is about 10 feet and it just fits uh, in there. And uh, it's a beauty. We have the Matinicus Rock Lens, which is a third order. And, and this is all in, in complete operating, uh, it, it really operates. And then the fourth orders, we have one from the, uh, the Cuckles. We have several fifth orders. We have the, the fifth order from uh, Dublin Point, that's down in the Kennebec. Uh, we have the Isla Ho uh, lens, uh, which uh, came from uh, uh, Lighthouse Robinson Point, also is called. Our other prize, and I, I, I think I have to call it that, is our sixth order. And uh, this is only, only about uh, 20 inches high. And one thing I want to say about the lenses, the lenses are the jewels, the gems of the lighthouse. On Seguin Island off Bath is Maine's only first order light. Largest lens, and since the island is high, Seguin becomes the highest light. It's distinctive for other reasons. After Portland Head, it was the second light station built in Maine. And because there's often heavy fog around, Seguin has one of the most powerful fog horns ever contrived. When it sounds, it's been known to knock seagulls out of the air from the concussion. Connie Small served on Seguin. It was a key light, meaning when it was turned on in the evening, all the other lights seeing it would start coming on. It was quite a sight to see it, too, because here they'd come, sometimes just one right after another. And I used to love to go up in the tower and watch them and say hello, hello to little friends all along the coast.
Lest we suggest that the keeper's life was soft, hear these stories. Of Marcus Hanna, who while tending two lights at Cape Elizabeth during a heavy storm, rescued the crew of a schooner being smashed to pieces on the rocks below. Of Abby Burgess, whose father was keeper at Matinicus Rock, but in 1859, when a ferocious January storm whipped up, the keeper had gone to the mainland and couldn't get back. His wife was sick, so it was up to the daughter, young Abby, to care for the family and to keep that light burning by herself for a month. Connie Small tells a story from Avery Rock of a five-day blizzard her husband desperately ill in a coma. Well, here I am. I was only 21 years old, alone, nobody at all that I could talk to or call because we had no communication. I kept putting water on his lips and doing what I could do, and I had to go up and keep the light going. I had to keep the bell going because it, that blizzard lasted for four or five days. So finally, one the fifth morning I went in and I looked at him and I did what I thought was right to check him. And there was absolutely no response. And I know as sure as I'm sitting here that that man was dead. So I went up, started to go up to light, put the light out. And I got as far as the door and I put my head on the door sill. And I said, I've done everything I know how. You'll have to help me, Lord. I went up and put the light out, and I came back. I went in, and I looked down, and he opened his eyes very feebly, and he says, I'm hungry. Well, I said, what do you want to eat? There's a tale of a shipwreck long ago at Hendricks Head, a place now owned by a wealthy sporting wear manufacturer and lighthouse fancier, Ben Russell. The keeper was unable to do anything because of the ferocity of this storm, but he did pull in a bundle. And it turned out to be a bundle of uh, feather mattresses, but uh, he heard a noise inside, so he opened it up, found a sea chest, and inside was a crying baby girl with a note that's from the uh, captain and his wife saying that they were committing the child into God's hands. So they rushed it into the lighthouse here at uh, Hendricks Head, the keeper's house, and uh, brought the child back to health. And having lost their child recently, they adopted it to be their very own and named this child Seaborn. Even when there were no babies washing ashore here at Hendricks Head, no one dying and coming back to life, it wasn't easy to be a keeper. Jeff Burke keeps a keeper's house today. Well, I can tell you that taking care of these buildings is a heck of a lot of work. The paint doesn't stay on the side of the building, the weather side, for more than a year or two. I mean, You've got to start all over again. And uh, they didn't have the benefit of uh, modern paints and materials and things like that. And uh, it was hard work. Of course, the, his primary duty was to the uh, light tower and the fog bell uh, to keep them uh, totally in excellent shape. But besides that, they had to worry about uh, supplies, uh, getting the kids to school, taking care of all the buildings, uh, filling out reports. You know, uh, always only look out for the inspector who came uh, unannounced with his white gloves on to make sure that there wasn't a speck of soot in the lantern. The keeper's room upstairs faces the tower. And uh, you could tell from the light coming through the window whether or not the thing was burning properly or not. And if it wasn't, he'd get up in the middle of the night and go and adjust it. Well, if keeping a lighthouse was a lot of work, 
and could be perilous. What was the appeal? What is the appeal yet today? It's hard for people to understand, I, I think, the love that people have for lighthouses. Fillmore Wass lived at Libby Island for over 20 years, wrote a book about it. And that it probably wasn't as rough a life as they thought. There is a mystique about lighthouses, and I'm not sure what it is. Everyone seems to be fascinated. We have people that come from all over town uh, in the morning or in the evening just to see the light, just to kind of connect with it, sort of a, uh, some constancy in their lives. It's a sense of place. And lighthouses represent a simpler time, a simpler way of life, something that people can relate to and something that they want to go back to. Tim Harrison runs the Lighthouse Depot in Wells, Maine, where one can purchase just about anything related to or in any way reminiscent of lighthouses, satisfying that inexplicable but powerful lure of the light. The public has just gone wild about lighthouses. Maybe the question, what is the appeal of lighthouses, is best answered just by looking at them. If it cannot be defined, it certainly cannot be denied. Lighthouses are built in the most spectacular locations on the coast, on points basically, on high land. Uh, they're beautiful. They look like statues, like great works of art. Jeff Burke lives by one of those works of art, having with his wife Judy transformed the keeper's house at Robinson Point on Isla Ho into an inn, accessible only by boat, gas lights, just a dozen or so guests, and Judy's delicious cuisine. It's something that I think just appeals to some people, and when it seems like when they get here, it's even more special than what they thought. Um, I think it's the remoteness. It's the idea of no telephone. People that just want to sort of take a little respite from life or something. And people really do find, find their selves here.
That's what they've always been for, lighthouses, to help people find themselves. What now for Maine's lighthouses? They've all been automated, no more keepers. With GPS, Loran, all the electronics of modern boats, there's not the same navigational need for them. So other uses are found. Maine's light stations still serve in many ways. Historically, Petitmanan Island and some of the other lighthouse islands were seabird nesting islands. Uh, but back around the turn of the century, uh, many of these seabirds were killed for their feathers to feed the millinery trade. After this was outlawed, the seabirds started to make a comeback, and many of them gravitated to, to the lighthouse islands because the, these islands were manned by uh, lighthouse keepers and their families and they uh, removed or shot the gulls, uh, great blackback gulls and herring gulls, which prey on seabirds. Uh, they shot them because they fouled the buildings and the water supply. So by removing the gulls, that allowed the seabirds to start coming back, uh, the populations to increase. Today, Petit Manan Island is a premier seabird nesting island that has uh, common terns, arctic terns, rosia terns, puffins, guillemots, and eider ducks.
other uses to which lighthouse islands today are being put, besides inn and refuge. Mount Desert Rock, 25 miles off to sea. Today, home to teams of whale researchers from Bar Harbor's College of the Atlantic, doing the most comprehensive cataloging of migrating whales ever attempted. Bear Island, off Northeast Harbor, leased as a summer home to a private citizen on the condition he spend thousands of dollars to restore and maintain it. Seguin, each year more than 100 people answer an ad hoping to win the right to live here all summer. For a couple from Colorado, what an idyllic vacation. We decided we were not going to spend another summer in our coat and tie in the office, so we moved to this nice tranquil island with a population of two. The differences are vast. We don't have pollution. We're surrounded by water. There's no traffic, no lines to stand in. The visitors are wonderful. We've thoroughly enjoyed them. They're here because they want to be. Some people love lighthouses so much they build their own, like this one on the coast at Bernard, which Irving Silverman uses in a way that, as far as we know, no other lighthouse, real or fantasy, is used. The treasured ones who stood amid God's splendor ever knew. Lord of the world, the king supreme, ere aught was formed, he reigned alone. Each week, it is a temple, its light holy. Made known. Crown of all time, the one who reigned before all mortal shape was made. Two more lighthouses serving distinctive purposes lie in the course of the Fox Island thoroughfare. At one end is Brown's Head. And what is it used for? Well, as a perk for the local town manager. In 1993, um, I became town manager of the town of Vinyl Haven, and part of my job is to live here at Brown's Head and to be the current keeper of the light. Living in a lighthouse is a unique and wonderful experience. In the center of the thoroughfare, the light at Goose Rocks serves both traditional purposes, to guide and to be appreciated. Then, on the other side of Vinyl Haven, is the light at Heron Neck. A few years ago, the Coast Guard was about to tear it down. The Island Institute campaigned to save it, eventually won the right to buy it and begin to restore it. And that gave people at the Island Institute a very good idea. So that by now, what this light has done is inspire the way of the future. The future is the Maine Lights Program. Congress was urged by the Island Institute to pass legislation establishing this program by which the federal government will continue to maintain these lights and their fog signals while relinquishing control of the rest of the properties surrounding the great lighthouses. Those properties will pass as appropriate to various civic and non-profit organizations which will ensure their survival.
the Maine Lights program is unprecedented. Uh, today, we can take heart that this legacy is going to continue. Maine is leading the nation, and I think the world, really, uh, in saving lighthouses. President George Bush spoke at the luncheon paying tribute to the Maine Lights program. Uh, by helping to keep these very special lighthouses uh, burning brightly into the next century, uh, you're showing better with actions than I possibly can with words uh, what it means to be one of a thousand points of light. The torch is being passed from those who for more than two centuries have served and endured along the rugged main seashore in service to others. Uh, people like Connie Small and her late husband Elson. We salute you. Connie Small and the others did what they did in lighthouses over the years because it was right. Not easy, rarely easy, but right. Maybe celebrating lighthouses, we are celebrating not just heroism and courage, steadfastness and endurance, but the simple idea of doing right. Maybe in this different and less simple time, we hope that we too, somehow, might be suffused with that light spirit. Whenever that light shines, it, it's, a, it's a spiritual emblem or a spiritual light.